Footage released by Hillsborough County in February 2024 revealed something impossible. Not a hurricane, not flooding, but the ground itself was tearing open beneath a quiet Tampa Bay neighborhood. In one year, Florida recorded more than 1,200 sinkhole insurance claims. But here is what the headlines do not tell you. This collapse did not come from the surface. It came from below, and it is accelerating under nearly every home. February 14, 2024. A roadway collapsed in Sefner, Florida. The crack stretched 23 meters, 75 feet across pavement that had been intact the day before. Vertical displacement measured 1.8 meters, six feet of ground simply vanishing downward. The time from initial fissures to complete failure was less than 48 hours. Nine homes were evacuated. NOAA confirmed rainfall was within normal range. There was no storm, no flood, no apparent trigger. The ground just opened. The expectation is that Florida sinkholes are rare, sudden, random acts of geology. The reality is that Tampa Bay sits atop thousands of mapped and unmapped limestone voids, many actively expanding beneath neighborhoods, schools, and highways. This is not a lightning strike. It is a slow motion structural failure that has been building for decades. Most collapses are not triggered by natural events. They correlate with groundwater pumping, population growth, and urban load stress. The collapse occurs years after development, not during construction. By the time the ground opens, the damage has already been done deep underground. This was not an accident. It was the final symptom of a system that has been failing invisibly for generations. The question is no longer why sinkholes are appearing. The question is how long Florida can continue growing while its foundation is dissolving beneath it. Florida is built on Eocene limestone, deposited 35 to 55 million years ago when this entire peninsula was underwater. The bedrock is highly karstic meaning it is prone to dissolution by slightly acidic groundwater. Under Tampa Bay, this limestone layer extends 300 to 600 meters deep. It is riddled with voids, caves, and channels carved by water moving through the rock over millennia. The Floridan Aquifer System sits within this limestone. It is one of the most productive freshwater aquifers on Earth, supplying drinking water to approximately 10 million Floridians. Before significant development, the natural recharge rate was around 25 centimeters per year. Rainwater percolated through soil and sand, slowly refilling the aquifer while maintaining a stable water table that provided pressure support to underground cavities. This is how it is supposed to work. Limestone dissolves slowly in slightly acidic groundwater, a process called karstification. This gradual dissolving forms caves and voids over geological timescales. Water table pressure supports the roofs of these underground cavities. As long as hydrostatic equilibrium is maintained, the, limes, the limestone roof remains stable. Collapse is prevented by the weight of water pressing upward from below, counterbalancing the weight of soil and rock pressing downward from above. Between 1950 and 1980, Tampa Bay appeared geologically stable. The population was approximately 1.2 million. Groundwater withdrawals averaged 350 million gallons per day. Sinkholes were considered localized geological anomalies, rare events that occurred in specific areas with known weak bedrock. Engineers built homes with shallow foundations. Developers mapped known sinkholes, but assumed the rest of the ground was solid. The system seemed to function as expected. By 2024, Tampa Bay Metro population had grown to 3.3 million. It is projected to reach 4.5 million by 2040. Between 2020 and 2024 alone, more than 180,000 new housing permits were issued. Each home adds an average foundation load of 35 to 60 tons to limestone already weakened by erosion. That is equivalent to placing a fully loaded semi-truck on bedrock that has been dissolving for thousands of years. 
The key mechanism that will fail is groundwater pressure. Once pumping lowers the water table, pressure support disappears. The limestone roof that was stable under hydrostatic equilibrium now bears the full weight of overlying soil and structures without counterbalancing force from below. Void roofs lose structural integrity. Collapse propagates upward through layers of sand and clay until the surface gives way. The failure becomes sudden and vertical, swallowing whatever sits above in seconds. This is how it was supposed to work. Until 2019, when something changed. Late 2019 into early 2020, the U.S. Geological Survey and Florida Geological Survey detected something unexpected. NASA INSAR satellite data, which measures ground elevation changes with millimeter precision, showed land subsidence across Hillsboro and Pasco counties. The initial rate was two to six millimeters per year. By 2023, the rate had accelerated to 12 to 18 millimeters per year. That is faster than subsidence measured in parts of New Orleans, a city famous for sinking into soft delta sediments. Dr. Thomas Greenhalk, a hydrogeologist with the USGS, said they initially assumed instrument error. The acceleration did not match historical karst behavior. Limestone dissolution was supposed to be a slow, steady process operating on timescales of centuries. Sudden acceleration over just four years violated every model they had developed based on decades of prior observation. The escalation timeline was clear. In 2020, emergency pumping was authorized during a drought. In 2021, Tampa Bay water withdrawal peaked at approximately 200 million gallons per day. In 2022, sinkhole insurance claims increased by 18% compared to the previous year. In 2023, multiple collapses occurred without any rainfall triggers. The ground was opening even during dry periods, which contradicted the assumption that sinkholes form primarily after heavy rain saturates soil and increases weight on cavity roofs. The mechanism behind the acceleration became clear through hydrogeological analysis. Pumping was lowering the water table by up to six meters in some areas. When water pressure disappeared, the effective stress on limestone increased dramatically. Effective stress is the load that rock actually feels after water pressure is removed. Think of it like removing a cushion from beneath a heavy weight. The weight does not change, but the support vanishes. Limestone that had been stable for millennia under natural water pressure was now bearing loads it was never designed to support. The roofs of underground voids began to fail. Cracks formed in limestone. Sand and clay above the limestone began to ravel downward into voids, creating what geologists call a cover subsidence sinkhole. In some cases, the process accelerated into cover collapse sinkholes, where the entire soil column fails suddenly. Florida was not cracking gradually. It was hemorrhaging pressure from below, and the structural consequences were propagating upward invisibly until the surface gave way without warning. Models failed because they assumed stable recharge rates. They ignored the compounding effect of urban load on already weakened bedrock. They underestimated how interconnected the void networks were beneath Tampa Bay. When one void collapsed, it altered pressure distribution across, across neighboring voids, creating a cascade effect that no model had predicted. The moment of undeniability came in August 2023. A sinkhole opened beneath a roadway in Brandon, Florida. The diameter measured 9 meters. There had been no rain for 17 days. The water table was at a historic low. There was no external trigger, no heavy storm, no construction vibration. The ground simply failed because the internal support structure had been eroded away by decades of pumping. Geologists could no longer attribute collapses to weather anomalies or rare geological conditions. The pattern was clear. Growth was destroying the aquifer, and the aquifer collapse was now destroying the surface. Water authorities and engineers proposed solutions. 
Each seemed logical based on established hydrogeological principles. Each failed when tested against the reality of accelerating collapse. The first theory was straightforward. If pumping causes collapse, reduce pumping locally in high-risk zones. Redirect withdrawals to areas with more stable geology. The logic seemed sound. Lower demand on compromised aquifer sections, allow water table recovery, restore pressure support to void roofs. Engineers calculated that a 20% reduction in withdrawals from East Tampa well fields would stabilize subsidence within five years. But water demand did not decrease. Population continued to grow. When pumping was reduced in one location, it was simply shifted to another. This created pressure gradients across, across the aquifer. Water flowed from high pressure zones toward low pressure zones. The result was that sinkholes began appearing outside the original reduction zones in areas previously considered stable. The problem had relocated, not resolved. The cascade failure extended geographically rather than stopping. The second theory proposed artificial recharge. If the aquifer was depleting, inject treated water back into the ground to raise water tables artificially. Cost estimates ranged from $1.2 to $1.8 billion for infrastructure. Engineers designed injection wells and surface spreading basins. The recharge rate was projected to restore 30% of lost aquifer pressure within 10 years. Ann Tahansky, a senior hydrologist, stated that you cannot refill a fractured system evenly. Water takes the path of least resistance. In an aquifer riddled with interconnected voids and channels, injected water flowed preferentially through high permeability zones. Some areas received excess recharge while others remained depleted. The uneven distribution meant that void roofs in low recharge areas continued to fail even as billions were spent on recharge programs. The geology was too complex, too fractured, to respond uniformly to human intervention. The third theory focused on engineering foundations. If the ground is unstable, build deeper. Drill foundation piles 30 to 60 meters down, through the soil and clay layers, into more competent limestone below. Transfer building loads to deeper, presumably more stable rock. The cost per home increased by $40,000 to $70,000. Developers began marketing deep foundation homes as sinkhole proof, but transferring load deeper simply transferred stress deeper. The piles terminated in limestone that was also part of the karst system. The added stress from concentrated pile loads caused fractures to propagate in deeper limestone layers. In some cases, this triggered collapses in larger voids that had been stable under distributed surface loads. The engineering solution made certain locations safer while destabilizing neighboring areas. It was hydraulic whack-a-mole. Solve one problem, create another. The fourth theory relied on mapping and avoidance. If sinkholes could be predicted, development could avoid high-risk areas. LIDAR surveys mapped surface depressions. Borehole drilling detected subsurface voids. Ground-penetrating radar identified anomalies in soil density. The resolution limit was approximately 10 to 15 meters. Engineers assumed that any void larger than this would be detected. Researchers at the University of South Florida Karst Lab noted that by the time you can map a void, it is already failing. Many voids are smaller than detection thresholds until the moment they collapse and expand rapidly. Others are masked by clay layers that block radar signals. The mapping provided a false sense of security. Developments were approved in low-risk zones that later experienced catastrophic collapses. The maps were always behind the reality of ongoing dissolution. Theory after theory collapsed under scrutiny. Every attempt to stabilize one zone created new pathways for failure in another. The development paradox. Manifested in every solution. Growth required water. Water required pumping. Pumping destroyed aquifer integrity. Aquifer collapse undermined growth infrastructure. 
There was no engineering solution that broke this cycle because the cycle was built into the economic model of continuous expansion on karst terrain. This is not a sinkhole problem. This is a growth-driven geological failure. The more Florida grows, the faster it destroys the ground that growth depends on. Limestone formation required millions of years of marine sedimentation. Aquifer recovery after depletion requires centuries of natural recharge. Economic lock-in to growth-dependent revenue streams operates on timescales of decades. The mismatch between geological restoration and economic demand makes reversal impossible within any relevant human time frame. This is not a fracture that can be repaired. It is terminal erosion of the substrate that supports civilization. The consequences cascade in predictable order. Ecologically, wetland collapse has already begun. Springs that once flowed year-round are drying up as the aquifer depletes. Spring flow reductions exceed 30% in some systems. Species that depend on constant groundwater discharge are experiencing population crashes. Timelines for localized extinctions range from 10 to 25 years if current trends continue. Economically, property devaluation is projected between 18 and $30 billion as sinkhole risk becomes priced into real estate markets. Insurance companies are withdrawing coverage from high-risk zones. Some neighborhoods are becoming uninsurable, which makes mortgages unavailable, which crashes property values even in areas that have not experienced collapses yet. Infrastructure repair costs already exceed $3 billion for roads, water mains, and sewer lines damaged by subsidence. These costs will compound as more failures occur. Socially, displacement risk affects approximately 250,000 homes built in moderate to high-risk zones. Many homeowners cannot afford to relocate. Many cannot sell properties that have lost value or are flagged on sinkhole databases. Health risks are emerging from well contamination as surface pollutants migrate into fractured aquifer systems through new pathways created by collapses. Communities are fragmenting as those who can afford to leave do so, while those who cannot remain in depreciating, dangerous neighborhoods. Politically, litigation against water authorities is accelerating. Homeowners are suing for property damage. Environmental groups are suing for aquifer mismanagement. Counties are suing each other over regional pumping agreements. The trust that government can manage this crisis is eroding as each proposed solution fails. Regulatory agencies are caught between economic pressure to approve development and geological reality that development accelerates the problem. The future timeline is grimly predictable. Between 2025 and 2030, insurance retreat will intensify. Mapping failures will become more frequent as voids outpace survey capacity. Between 2030 and 2040, managed abandonment zones will be designated in the highest risk areas. Property buyouts will begin, but funding will be insufficient. Infrastructure triage will prioritize critical systems while allowing less essential roads and services to fail. Beyond 2040, the question becomes which neighborhoods can be maintained and which must be surrendered to ongoing geological collapse. The impossible choice is now unavoidable. Do we sacrifice growth, accept economic contraction, limit population increase, and reduce water demand to levels the aquifer can sustain? Or do we sacrifice stability, continue expanding, extract resources at current rates, and accept that the ground will continue opening beneath homes, schools, and critical infrastructure. There is no option that protects both. Growth and stability are now mutually exclusive in Tampa Bay. Florida is building upward while its foundation liquefies. Every new home, every new resident, every gallon pumped from the aquifer accelerates the dissolution of limestone that has supported this peninsula for millions of years. The pace of destruction is no longer measured in geological time. It is measured in quarterly development reports and annual subsidence surveys. The question is no longer whether the ground will collapse.
The question is, how many people will still be standing on it when it does?